Okay, so we have a couple things to finish up with the third century, and then I want us to take some time and uh, discuss a little bit some of the things we talked about with the second and third century before moving on into the fourth. We ended up last Thursday by talking about the development of the Christian calendar, how some days were held as being uh, more special or uh, more to be honored. Of course, the first day of the week being um, you know, in, in place since the first century, but then also by the third century remembering the, the death dates of the martyrs and holding those people in, in high regard for their, um, their willingness to die for Christ. We also see in the third century the development of Christian art. And predominantly a lot of Christian art is preserved for the day uh, in catacombs. Uh, the catacombs were not hideouts, um, but were uh, especially uh, special, uh, they were uh, places where special services were done. Uh, the catacombs uh, were places of burial, right? and so uh, uh, dead bodies there uh, in places like Rome, other places throughout Europe. Almost 60 catacombs have been discovered in Rome, uh, more in other places. Uh, over 750,000 people are buried in miles and miles of tombs in places like this. We're talking about a, a place where a time when burial was uh, preferable to cremation. And a, a lot of the art that exists from this time period uh, is in these catacombs. The art is what we might term it very simple, um, not necessarily what we might think of as good art, but appears to be like the first steps of um, people trying to uh, incorporate art uh, into their uh, worship of God. Now, what we see a lot of art that has been uh, preserved are largely uh, biblical scenes. And so there are uh, some stock figures that appear, stock characters. Several times Jesus is depicted in some of this artwork. Here, um, as a, a teacher, uh, seated and teaching, but what do you notice about this depiction of Jesus compared to artistic representations of Jesus in the current period? Short hair, no beard. Short hair, short hair and no beard. <laughs> uh, probably looks more like uh, what a Roman citizen would look like than necessarily a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth. And right underneath it, of course, is burial space. Um, some of the bones you can still see in that picture. Depictions of Jesus as the, the Good Shepherd, for example, uh, you might be able to make out that that's a sheep that is being carried. Um, but uh, you know, representations related to the characteristics of Jesus, and less necessarily about trying to depict how Jesus looked. Other biblical scenes also appeared in early Christian art. Looking at this scene, what would you think is the narrative being depicted there? Uh, good guess because there's three, um, but no, it's not the Mount of Transfiguration. No? No? Uh, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can kind of make out maybe some of the smoke and flames down there, um, but preserved through the fire. Now, remember, I told you the art wasn't necessarily good. Is that green or red? Yeah, it's uh, kind of a reddish one with some brown. I don't know for sure what Another depiction of, of Jesus seated, uh, seated among his uh, disciples. I don't know that this would necessarily be a Last Supper, although we, we might say, oh, it kind of looks like Da Vinci's Last Supper with Jesus in the center and the, the uh, apostles around him. Um, but 
you know, some, that idea of Jesus and, and teaching among his um, apostles. Other pictures here in the catacombs. What do you think this, what biblical story do you think is represented in this part? Jonah? It's Jonah, all right? Um, but it's definitely not a whale, right? It's sort of some other type of sea beast creature, um, but definitely not a whale. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. How about this one? It's Noah and a very, 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 very tiny ark. Right? <laughs> He's floating in a cardboard box. Right? How are you going to get two of every kind of animal? How are you going to get your family in that ark, let alone two of every kind? Uh, you can kind of maybe make out uh, uh, doves, right? Have you ever heard the, the legend of uh, Noah and the cardboard box? No, I've not heard the legend of Noah and the cardboard box. <laughs> but it doesn't have a window. Oh my goodness. <laughs> right? Uh, not that you can just stand up and say, yeah, the water's still around. <laughs> and if you were in a cardboard box, it would be probably after a day. Right? <laughs> not very useful. Um, uh, yeah, and, and Aaron and I have had discussions about how contemporary Christian media might not always be good. Right? <laughs> The long heritage of Christian media, not always being, you know, um, you kind of kind of make out what's been preserved a little bit of the waters there. Thing. Also, you find not just biblical themes, but um, biblical imagery as well, or not biblical imagery, but but symbols related to Christianity. So anchors. You might not be able to make that out because the quality of the picture and the projection, but there's an anchor here. Uh, anchors were quite common. Um, thinking of the uh, the image from uh, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, about the you know the the anchor of the soul. Um, the the fish, which is still shows up in people's cars, and bumper stickers and other types of and jewelry and stuff. Anybody know why? A fish. Why did a fish become a symbol related to Christianity? Didn't the fish become like an acronym for... Matthew had it. But you're right. <laughs> yes. So the, the fish, the Greek word for fish, was uh, an acronym for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, or Ichthus in the Greek. And so that's where the fish <coughs> comes from. What was that? Yeah, the other key, theta, oops, the one. But it's got to do with And um, I mentioned last time of Tertullian saying, uh, writing that, uh, you know, we're all little fishes born in water following our big foods. Right? And so it's a very early uh, image connected to uh, Christianity. Uh, another one is the, the key row, and I'll, I'll blow that one up a little bit or, or give you a better look at the key row. Um, a symbol for Christ early on, an overlap of the Greek letter key and then the letter row. Being the first two letters in Greek of Christos. And so you spell Christos or Christ in Greek because it starts with key and row. And so um, you have this uh, this overlap of the, the key and the row, uh, which I have to kind of give props. Vaughn Park's ministry, college ministry, right, uses the Vaughn Park, right? <laughs> it's usually the key row, but uh, it has the V and the P. <laughs> Cut out of it. Other symbols include a dove, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, as Jesus says in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and so you'll find Alpha and Omega on a lot of, of the catacomb arts. And also a phoenix. Now, why a phoenix? Resurrection, Resurrection right? So the, even though it's a Greek myth, right? And so here's one of those places where there's that conflation. Right? Greek myth about this bird that suddenly flames out 
and then out of the ashes rise, rises the new birth, the new phoenix. And so phoenix became uh, a symbol for a lot of uh, Greek Christians, Greek and Roman Christians as well. In addition to the development of Christian art in the third century, it also appears that in the third century we see much more clearly the development of church buildings. Right? Buildings that are specifically meant for the worship of Christians. A lot of the buildings, or a lot of the places where Christians gathered before this time tended to be house churches or public space that was used for something else. Right? So when you read through the early chapters of Acts, Christians are meeting in some areas of the temple grounds, right? And so that would have been a, a part of that as well. But in the third century, we begin to see more buildings specifically dedicated to, um, to worship space. Uh, one of the most famous that has been excavated is Duryaropus. Duryaropus uh, is in uh, the country of Syria. It was built in mid-third century and uh, excavated in 1922. Here's a, a picture from uh, Duryaropus. It appears that it was originally a house that was converted to a church building and could hold around 50 to 75 people. As you can see, uh, a lot of painting had been done in, uh, in the house. Anybody want to hazard a guess of what's pictured in this part of Duryaropus? Yeah, well, yeah, the author comment there. Baptistry. Yeah, a baptistry. Right? This area right here appears to have been a baptistry, but some scholars have suggested it could not have held enough water for somebody to be immersed in, totally immersed in. So that's a rather interesting uh, aspect of uh, Dura Europus. Here's kind of a floor plan. I don't know if you'd be able to make it around the house of uh, what probably uh, was um, a part of the Dury Europus. This is the area that was just pictured in that last slide over there into the uh, upper right. And this, this area here probably on the left, probably where uh, they would have had assemblies, uh, believe teaching areas and courtyard, uh, those kind of things. Very simple structure, um, but we'll see as we go through the other centuries of how uh, those uh, structures, the church building structure, of course, uh, evolves and, and changes throughout time. Because we're still talking about time period, uh, this Dury Europus was probably built around the time period that Diocletian's persecution started. And so around that mid-time. Uh, mid and so once Christianity becomes more of an accepted religion and then eventually a uh, an official religion within the Roman Empire, you start to see more of these spaces that have been discovered, many of, of which might still stand. What questions do you have about Christian art or church buildings or comments? Um, okay, based on this map, the entire building, courtyard, and everything, what would you say, like, how would it compare to maybe like a church building of the whole of the same type of thing? Would be a similar size or bigger? Probably would be a similar size. I mean, you know, you think about this, this was probably a, a pretty good sized house. Right? It, it does have a, uh, an upper floor. I think most of the upper floor is, is, of course, gone. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the measurements. I'm sure I could find them, but I'm, I'm not really sure. But, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly not a very big structure. Uh, when you think of church buildings these days, it sometimes can hold up to a thousand or more people, uh, you know, very, very simple building, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's one where we see, you know, fairly early on this, we need to specifically worship space instead of just meeting in houses. Other questions or comments? All right, so let's think now, we're, we're getting ready to move on into the fourth century, and, and a lot of things begin to happen in the fourth century that will be significant changes both for political aspects of Christianity but also cultural and social aspects as well. So before we move on into that, let's, let's take some time to, to think about and assess 
Christianity in the second and third centuries, based on the past couple of classes. What would be your overall assessment? If you had to describe what was going on in Christianity in the second and third centuries, what would you say? All right, so persecution uh, is a, a very important aspect of understanding this time period. Okay, so deviation in practice. Okay, discovering of identity, both inside and in relation to outside. Okay, so there's that connection of, of trying to figure out what to do about paganism with some people wanting to, to make some connections. Martyrdom has been a Yeah, so you had so martyrdom and not just persecution but, but death and then you know respecting those people. Having some different doctrines as well. Okay, the development of uh, Christian doctrine or, or changes uh, in Christian doctrine. Now, overall, how, how does this, I mean, we probably all came here with a mindset of kind of a little bit of what early Christianity was like. How is that confirmed or maybe reshape your thinking about early Christianity. Well, I kind of first started going through the second century and third century Christianity. It kind of, it kind of shook my faith a little bit just because to be deviated so much from what we have today and also kind of what the first century seemed to be in the Bible, uh, it kind of shook my faith just to think, maybe we can't get Christ. Because these people were so close to the apostles that they even, you know, could trace their lineage or trace their relation back to them. And some people tried to, and they still weren't on things. From what I would consider correct. So that's one thing that kind of affects me. Okay. okay. I was I was kind of brought up in the uh, very conservative Church of Christ in northern Missouri, uh, formed in Alabama. Where it's coming into life. You know, if, 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 if things aren't done the way that we do things, you're going to I'll give you just so staunch and untied about we're doing what person here says, we're doing what Bible says, we are right. Then you look at stuff like this and you start getting on the shelf and think about things, you're like, you try to do everything right, you still need to get things wrong. So, and they got strong, like, like you were saying, they got stuff wrong that, that early on. It's just kind of crazy to think about it. It does shake your faith and kind of opens your mind a little bit and that's your faith and growth too to realize, like, we can't be perfect, we can't go right, and so... Kind of Both of you have kind of pointed, and probably if we pulled, we'd, we'd find uh, several people that would suggest this, that, that, they, that these people in, in the second and third century got some things wrong. We use the words deviated or changed to refer to doctrine or practice. Um, where are these places that you say they've got some things wrong or they deviated? When they start taking philosophy, and it's kind of like a <clears throat> an addition. A lot of any kind of uh, created in uh, with Origin and Alexandria, where it's going you know, to take place and just generate a Christianity with it. So they kind of deviated from false doctrine. I mean, deviated from Bible with false doctrine. I mean, kind of like other things influence them, but it you know, should be an influence. I think I see that like. Um, Arian into the Gnosticism and um, all these divisions and Ergos as far as philosophy goes, and then they even did like uh, Arian into the Gnosticism in practice, they had like the, the baptismal preparation that's not done in scripture. They you prepare you know, days and weeks at a time to finally make your kitchen, get baptized, and do this sort of thing, have this sort of ceremony, and none of it's back in scripture. And then at times it changed from immersion, which is what baptism was, because that's what it means. But 
Things change. Everything's so much changed from what the Bible said. step back and look at it, presents us with a difficulty in the sense, especially with the New Testament, that these letters are occasional. There are specific things going on in Corinth that Paul is addressing. There are specific things going on in Galatia that Paul is addressing. Yet there is also that continuity of God's activity among human beings, right? And, and what, and, you know, uh, in the Old Testament into uh, the life of Jesus, into the life of the church. And so we have continuity, but we also have uh, occasional. And so but the, the idea of you know, them having a limited or more limited understanding perhaps than what we do, which again kind of brings it back to the question of are we better off in one sense in that we had access to what I, I think we can feel confident in our faith that what we have is, is God's will, God's word, 
Yet, they didn't have all of that. And if we believe, and I think this is pretty, probably pretty accurate, and it seems to fit historically, that by the third century, the miraculous age has ceased. So there, there aren't people that could miraculously, uh, despite what Tertullian thought, um, you know, uh, miraculously reveal truth. You know, they're perhaps more limited in some of these places than, than we were, than we, than we are, uh, and what we have access to. But on the other hand, does that mean that we're going to be judged more harshly than they because we have access to what they didn't have access to? And that we have the totality um, of, of what God has revealed versus, I mean, maybe some of those churches might have only had the apostles, uh, you know, the, the writings of Paul. Now, by the third century, it's, it's, you know, seems to be circulating a, a lot more together, or there's a list of uh, canon, as we talked about. So it's, it's not a totally uh, something that happens at the, the, the end of the fourth century, and it's, it's not totally that somebody is uh, making decisions. But I think what we have here is, is a very complex situation. We can't simply say, uh, you know, uh, we know more than they do, yet we also have access to more than what they do, or what they did, excuse me, yeah, my verb tense is correct. Any last comments or assessment of the second and third century? I think uh, this is kind of a kind of side of the that uh, as far as like, we talk about they didn't have a can all put together, and so yeah, they just kind of, um, you know, the standard here and there, and so they had different communication stuff. I think even today, in a similar way, it's almost like based on what type of, which version of the can you use, your faith is going to go a certain direction. And so it's like, even, you know, even when we still have a can, we have all these different versions of the can, and different wordings of the can. And if you follow one conversion, you're kind of going to follow a certain direction of your faith. There's just a five gazillion variations, deviations. And in the end, you just have to say, I know what God's word says, ultimately. I know that God has mercy on things. That's wrong. I'm trying to be kind. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think it comes down to is that there are certain key teachings and, and doctrines that no matter what form of the canon you're using, Right, whether that's an English translation, whether that's a translation into uh, any of another languages, whether you're going back to the original Greek or Hebrew, that there's some key core things that I think can be understood, and then I think certainly the versions can cause additional problems uh, in, in some respect, but all, I think largely those problems tend to be in passages um, you know, that, that aren't core things. You know, for example, like, who's the man of sin or the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? And there's a lot of deviation in that. What does the baptism for the dead refer to in 1 Corinthians 15, 29? Uh, you know, those kind of things. Well, they don't appear to be key doctrines that we need to be that concerned about. But things related to our, our, our salvation, things related to Jesus' resurrection, uh, I think these are places where uh, there, there is a clarity there no matter what type of, um, and even what type of English translation you're using. Any other comments, evaluations? I think at any time, there's a focus way too much on, you know, like the problems in certain areas, and really, you know, you can use the Bible to, um, or like factor in the uh, apostles and their words and everything, is your relationship with God and kind of understanding Him. And I know that, I think um, somewhere in the uh, reading, someone said, I um, can't remember now, but um, that God created us to kind of understand him and you can come up to his level almost. Um, 
I don't know if I agree with that completely, but um, that really kind of helped me understand him more in a way. Um, and I think that we kind of lose a lot of that, lose part of our relationship with God because we're so focused on doctrine and what we need to do, like, you know, how God's is supposed to go and everything. And, like, our salvation is extremely important, but, you know, we also need to focus on um, our relationship with God and that, you know, the whole, um, if you have love and um, the virtues, everything else kind of falls into place um, if you have the right heart. I think ultimately, yeah, we we have to we have to allow for God's grace in all of this. Uh, none of us is going to get it right, 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. Uh, and and so I think that we we should be charitable to these people that are are facing persecution, right? And they're trying to figure some of these things out. They are they're facing uh, you know these, these I think quite obviously false teachings, right? I, I think that. You know, when we we might be tempted to say, well, I don't want to judge them uh, because uh, you know I'm I'm imperfect, and, and that's that's true. And, and yes, we we don't have the right or the responsibility to say where Irenaeus is right in the afterlife, or where even Origen is in the afterlife. Um, maybe Diocletian, but you know, but. but on the other hand, though, I think when we look at some of these teachings, like Gnosticism, it runs so counter to what God says in the Bible about the goodness of the physical universe, right? about the reality of Jesus' humanness, and how that's vitally important for salvation. When you look at the Gnostics who are teaching against both of those things, I think we can quite clearly say Gnosticism is not what Orthodox Christianity is was all about. Right? And so, yes, in, in one sense, we, we want to be charitable to, toward the people, but I think we can also, um, there are some places where we can do some righteous judgment uh, and, and righteous discernment, uh, we might say, uh, about some of those teachings you know, from, from the past.